Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Sorry for a little bit of a late start. Um, I was, as, as well as one of our panelists, Jennifer McDowell, racing over here from the mayor's State of the City address, uh, which luckily for us was in Lincoln Heights, not too far away, at uh, Lincoln High School. Um, and during, germane to the, to the conversation this evening, um, during those remarks, the mayor announced the establishment of what's, what he's calling the Los Angeles Climate Emergency Council to, as he put it, direct our city's efforts in sustainability, a council that will draw the best ideas from neighborhoods on the front lines of climate change, harness the expertise of scientists, and recommend long-term actions to reduce rising temperatures. And along with education uh, and housing, climate change was very much at the center of the mayor's remarks this evening. Um, was anybody else there? Did anyone else make it a double, double bill? Okay. Uh, one, okay, yes, one of you. Nice job. Um, so I'm Christopher Hawthorne. I'm uh, the Chief Design Officer for the City of Los Angeles in, in the office of Mayor Garcetti and also Professor of the Practice here at Occidental. Welcome to the third and final event of the spring in our third LA series. Um, we're here to talk about shade. Um, let me do a quick survey of the audience as I typically do. How many of you attended either the March 6th event that we did at Barnstall or the March 27th event at MOCA? Okay, terrific. And for how many of you is this the first third LA event that you've attended? Okay. Um, how many of you came from west of the 405? <laughs> a brave few. Did anyone come from west of the 405 on public transit? You get a special... Third LA badge, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, they're on their way. Uh, I grew up in the Bay Area. I was a Giants, San Francisco Giants fan, if, and Candlestick Park was infamously cold and freezing. If you made it through an extra inning night game, they gave you a little pin called a quad to candlestick. So the hardest core fans had a bunch of those on their, on their hats. Um, this is our version. So thank you, thank you all for being here. Um, we, I've really been uh, pleased with the panelists. I've been able to, um, to cajole and convince, um, and it really hasn't been that hard to join us in these events. And this one is no exception. This is really the, these are all the people I thought of immediately when we decided to do a conversation about shade, particularly as shade is an equity issue in a warming Los Angeles, as I mentioned, the mayor talked um, at significant length in the state of the city address this evening about uh, climate change as the uh, along with inequality, the challenge that this generation of Angelino leadership faces. Um, so this is an image that we will come back to. I'm gonna just give you a brief overview of some of the themes that we'll talk about. Um, you all have programs, I hope, and thanks to Ali Gordon and Michelle Levin, and everyone at Oxy for all their help, and particularly putting those programs together. It's a new feature this year for, um, for the Third LA programs, and we're very grateful to have them. We often have quite a few moving parts and panelists, so it's nice, I think, to have a scorecard. Um, this is an image from Kevin Lynch's uh, archive at MIT. Kevin Lynch, the famous urban planner who wrote a book called Image of the City in 1960. Um, it's unclear whether he took this photograph or he found it. Um, it makes very clear, I think, some of the um, themes that we'll talk about. I, I apologize for how fuzzy it is, but it's two figures lying in the shade cast by a tree. I think simplifying the issue for us, really, a, a kind of a diagram for um, the need to create uh, spaces for people um, and what that means in a, a city like Los Angeles as we face uh, encroaching climate change. The title of the event comes from a 1942 uh, book by Timothy Turner. I've always loved the title. It's sort of a noir um, um, spin on the idea of the sunshiny promise of Los Angeles and, and therefore the boosterism that has accompanied um, so much promotion of Los Angeles uh, uh, during the 20th century. I never actually read it until I was preparing for this event. Um, it's not a, I would say, sterling work of fiction, but um, it is a collection of linked short stories, uh, very much noir in fl flavor about kind of the dark side of Los Angeles, hence the title, and there are a couple of other, and I love this uh, guy, we'll see, I think, in, in one of our panelists, uh, images, this idea of um, this, uh, the, the kind of paltry shade that's cast by a single uh, bus stop pole or lamppost. Another, another cover has an image of what I think is um, probably Pershing Square, 
pre-parking garage, um, which suggests a, a very much a, a shaded kind of paradise. And that boosterism, of course, that idea of sunshine as being an, um, the central calling card for Los Angeles for so much of the 20th century um, could be seen, of course, in uh, our orange crates and the kind of boosterish uh, promotional materials that went along with them. And architecture as well, this is the cover of a recent survey of modernism in Los Angeles architecture by Thomas Hines, really the dean of architectural historians in Los Angeles, teaching it now emeritus at UCLA. Um, or uh, uh, to give a more recent example, this book by Lyra Kilston uh, called Sunseekers, which was about just that combination of kind of climate opportunity uh, and boosterism in um, Los Angeles as a place to come to improve your health through the sun and through the climate. But that notion has changed quite dramatically, of course, as we think about um, 21st century Los Angeles and climate change and the, and the increasing number of days of intense heat which we are facing across the city and county. Um, and, this is, and that gets right to a question of equity and inequality. This is an image that one of the writers whose essay about shade we will be hearing uh, a little excerpt from later on, Sam Valentine, who wrote uh, a recent very good piece about uh, urban design in Cuba, and particularly um, uh, public spaces in Cuba. Um, he sent me this image. Uh, he said he was waiting for a lift to come from the farmer's market, and he was looking at the satellite view of where he was in Los Angeles as somebody who's not um, a native Angelino, and noticed this kind of, if you squint a little bit, you can really see it, this kind of circle of, of shade, of green amenity in uh, the wealthiest uh, section of, of this uh, middle of the city, what Rainer Banham famously called the Plains of Id in Los Angeles. Um, and it's very true, no matter what metric we use, and we have some better ones now than we used to, shade, um, and the, the kinds of opportunities and attractions that come with it is distributed dramatically unequally across the city. This is an image by Sarah, one of our panelists that I've used, um, thanks to her with her permission on, in many recent talks that um, suggest to me how much we have our work cut out for us across the city, not just in thinking about shade, but really thinking about the design of the public realm and really what's at the center of the challenge that the mayor has given me in this newly created position called Chief Design Officer to think about this entire right of way and the ways that we've neglected it. And I think particularly beginning with shade, but also when I look at an image like this, I, you know, you see a gas station which um, doesn't mark the street wall. So not only are you waiting in the shadow of this pole, um, there, there's nothing in the urban design of this space that um, suggests a kind of um, a welcome for transit riders or, or residents in, in neighborhoods across the city that face this kind of deficit. Certainly, when we talk about shade, we will t be talking about, and the intersection of shade and urban design, we will be talking about tree canopy. This is Milan. Um, that often, architecture writers, when they're asked to name the, their um, favorite streets in the world, will name streets like this one, which um, are really more notable or is as notable for their tree canopy as for their architecture. Um, this one is a tram line as well, so it's architecture, tree canopy, and transit wrapped together. This is another image that we'll see later on, um, which uh, is illustrating one of the pieces we'll hear an excerpt from by Joyce Linden, and this is an image by Joyce and, and Maynard Linden, the architect. Um, so we're talking about trees and tree canopy. We're also talking about street furniture, and Jennifer McDowell, my colleague in the mayor's office, will talk a little bit later on about um, our rethinking of street furniture strategy across the city and what that means in terms of addressing some of these questions. And then there's really a strong architectural role to play. Um, this is Bologna, uh, um, another Italian city famous for these porticos, which um, are really an architectural gesture over the right of way. Um, and suggest the role that a kind of architectural solution uh, might begin to play. I was recently in Auckland in New Zealand. This is a street called Ponsonby Road, which is one of the shopping districts in Auckland. And it's a little hard to see in this image, but all along this street, there's a combination, a collection of awnings, porticos, some architectural strategies which shade and protect the sidewalk from rain, which is as much of an issue as sun in Auckland for much of the year. Um, and the 
this is something that goes back to the 19th century, but the city has now mandated that new construction, um, that uh, architects and developers have to continue this canopy or portico or awning uh, consistently along the sidewalks on both sides of the street. And so there are a number of architectural, that doesn't have to match what's next to it. There, there's a, a kind of a variety of architectural solutions that, um, that produce this effect. But as a pedestrian in this district, you feel very much um, that there is a kind of consistent level of attention that the city is paying um, to these issues. But we also have a tradition in Los Angeles. This is, uh, this is Bertram Goodhue at Caltech, um, a place where I frequently walk with uh, one of my daughters and, um, and often are grateful for the shade, which is very much an architectural creation. And also, um, we, we have a history of a similar kind of awning. This is, these are two images of downtown Los Angeles, uh, turn of the century, and this is probably late 20s. Uh, you can tell why the Miracle Mile was created, right? Congestion in downtown Los Angeles was getting um, to the point where inventive Angelinos were beginning to think about um, expansion beyond the, the downtown core. But if you look carefully at these images, you see the same kind of awning treatment, the same kind of consistent treatment of, um, of shade as a kind of amenity that could be expected in the same way that street lights and other kinds of utilities might be provided. Um, and rain protection, of course. And so one of the uh, goals of the Third LA Framework is always to think about, um, as we confront new challenges like climate change, the extent to which we have uh, some solutions in our own history and our own civic d DNA, as it were. And as is true in the housing conversation, we have a great tradition of multifamily innovative residential architecture at a scale and um, style that's really been appropriate to Los Angeles and its, and its climate. I mentioned the architect Irving Gill, almost every one of these events. Similarly, in terms of how we thought about street design, there is in our own history um, a set of lessons which might be recovered uh, and reassessed in terms of looking forward. And, in, and speaking of looking forward, as we think about the Olympics, we had an event right here a couple of years ago as part of this series which looked at uh, the legacy, design legacy, of the 1932 and 1984 Los Angeles Olympics uh, with an eye, of course, toward 2028 and thinking what our design and architectural strategy might be. I think there's a really interesting uh, case to be made that the strongest legacy of those two Olympiads uh, in terms of their effect on the city and their relationship to architecture and design had to do with corridors, uh, with public space, the right-of-way urban design, Whatever we think about palm trees now and the shade they give or don't give, um, the late 20s and early 30s, in particular leading up to the 32 Olympic Olympics, was one of the first times that we um, planted palm trees in a comprehensive way around the city. Also, of course, Olympic Boulevard is called Olympic Boulevard because um, the 32 Olympics was the 10th Olympiad and we changed 10th Street um, to Olympic Boulevard. So that sort of corridor model of urban design improvement uh, connected to the Olympics is something that I think we, we can look back to. Similarly, the great design strategy for 84 uh, by Deborah Sussman and John Jurdy's office uh, had as much to do with a kind of movable shade, uh, s series of shade structures uh, as it did um, architecture per se. So that's all a, a way of saying that we uh, we look back to look forward as we do in all of these events, but we also do it now with a particular kind of urgency, um, given uh, how little attention we've paid to so many uh, um, rights of way around the city um, and the kind of deficit that we have to make up for, uh, and, and a deficit that we have to make up for as the clock um, is ticking in terms of, of climate change. And when I think about what this means in terms of equity, I think the easiest way to explain it is to say that those uh, fellow citizens who don't have the luxury of getting into a car or an Uber or a Lyft on those particular day, th those days of, of uh, intense heat, um, we need to have a design strategy across the city that is thinking uh, about their needs as much as it's thinking about anyone else's. Um, and that as we, as Los Angeles in the post-war decades, like many cities, turns its attention to the private realm and to a kind of privatization, um, we, we lost that thread like, like many American cities. So uh, with that, I would like to bring, um, thank you again for being here, and bring our first pair of student speakers to the podium. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robert Fain, a senior at Oxy. This is an essay called Shade, 
by, Am by Sam Block that will be published in full next week on the website Places Journal. We're grateful to Sam for allowing us to share this excerpt. As the sun rises in Los Angeles, a handful of passengers wait for a downtown bus in front of Tony's Barbershop on an exposed stretch of Figueroa Street near the Pasadena Freeway. Like Matryoshka dolls, they stand one behind another, still in quiet, in the shadow cast by the person at the head of the line. It's going to be another 80 degree day and riders across the city are lining up behind street signs and telephone poles. For years, the business owners on this block have tried to do something about the lack of shade. First, someone planted banana trees and jammed an I-beam into the sidewalk well. Tony Cornejo, the barber, swears he didn't do it, but he admits rigging up a gray canvas between a highway sign and parking lot fence to put a roof over the makeshift shelter. He dragged wooden crates under the canopy and nailed them together to create two long benches. In the shade, people ate their lunches, read magazines, scrolled through their phones. Can collectors rested, bus drivers waited before beginning their shifts. There are nearly 1,900 official bus shelters in Los Angeles city limits, but only a handful within two miles of Tony's Barbershop. Who decides where the shade goes? You might imagine that transit planners call the shots, strategically placing shelters outside grocery stores and doctor's offices on high frequency routes, according to community need. But Los Angeles, like many cities, has outsourced the job. The first thousand shelters were installed in the 1980s by billboard companies in exchange for the right to sell ad space, and they tended to show up in wealthy areas where ad revenue surpassed maintenance costs. In 2001, the mayor signed a deal to double the number of shelters and give public officials greater control over their placement. The new vendor agreed to install and maintain shelters throughout the city and offset its losses with freestanding ad kiosks in lucrative areas. But when politically savvy constituents complained about the coming spate of advertising, the city withheld the permits and the deal broke down. As the contract nears its end, the vendor, out front to co has installed only about 650 new shelters, roughly half the projected number. Another reason why there's no bus shelter in front of Tony's Barbershop is the street design. Figueroa is a major artery with five travel lanes, two parking lanes, modest sidewalks, and storefronts that come right up to the edge of the property line. You can't install a shelter here without disrupting underground utilities near the curb a right-of-way controlled by multiple city agencies, violating the Americans with Disabilities Act, which requires four-foot clearance for wheelchairs or blocking driveway sight lines. The same goes for street trees. On this block, shade is basically outlawed. Hi, I'm Mariana Baboni, and I'm also a senior at Oxy. I'll be reading from an essay called What Landscape Architects and Urban Designers Can Learn About Public Space from Cuba by Sam Valentine. It was published this month on the website Common Edge, accompanied by a handful of photographs by the author, some of which you'll see behind me as I read. It was certainly what I had come for. I was sitting on broad cobbled steps watching people interact in the public realm. It was an August afternoon in Cuba, and I had found temporary respite from the harsh sun beneath a haphazard array of trees. My design work as a landscape architect focuses on urban parks, streetscapes, and academic campuses, and, and I wanted to see how differently the open spaces of Cuba might function. Something about the scene immediately reminded me of Kevin Lynch, the great urban planner and theorist best known for his influential 1960 book, The, Images, the Image of the City. My boss, principal of Richard Burke Associates, was interested in Lynch's theories of urban perception and how they might overlap with the legacies of landscape design. As a result, I was tasked with flipping through nearly every page of the Lynch archives, taking notes and filling out a multitude of reproduction request forms. One loose photograph in box number eight stood out. Near th neither the location nor the photographer is documented, but the significance of the image leaps from the print. Two human forms, perhaps day laborers, college students, or drunks, lie supine in the small island by shade cast of a young tree in an otherwise open lawn. 
reading as clearly as a diagram the image captures landscape inhabitants seeking refuge from the beating sun, and the clarity of the snapshot lodged itself in my mind. Then, in the summer of 2016, I arrived in Havana, Cuba, land of Russian missiles and classic American cars, cold wars and cold shoulders, an embargo of goods and of people, consequently, frozen in time. Around noon one day, I had an embarrassingly late epiphany under the blazing sun. In the town of Trinidad, visitors lounged together on the edges of Plaza Mayor, participating in a mixture of optional and social activities on a tall curb shaded by a single-story colonial building. Hours later, with the sun a bit to the west, the sliver of shade had disappeared, and the same piece of plaza had become inhospitable. Now the only people to be seen were in the distance, bunched beneath the shady sanctuary of trees. While Plaza Mayor was tracing a simple diagram of comfort versus discomfort due to solar exposure, things got even more interesting in the northeast corner. The surface of the plaza turns uphill, reminiscent of Rome's Spanish steps, and a half dozen trees sprawl benevolently over the cobbled terraces, the place I described in my opening sentences. Here, people were hunkered over their phones in something of an organic Venn diagram, drawn where the visible outline of the tree's shadows overlapped with the invisible radius of public Wi-Fi hub. From my childhood in Georgia, I, had only fuzzily, I could only fuzzily recall some idiom about even dogs being smart enough to sit in the shade. It is not lost on me that all of these observations I am sharing here would be labeled common sense. However, despite the clear influence that the sun has on human comfort, solar exposure analysis all too often comes as an afterthought to grand pattern making, architectural expression, and materiality. In spite of the totalitarian government the world hears so much about, the Cuban public spaces I observed appeared less prescriptive, more flexible, and, unless it was all a complex ruse, far more democratic than the majority of parks and street streetscapes excuse me, in the US. There was an informal and imperceptible blending of public ways to semi-private stoops that, coupled with low-speed pedestrian prioritized streets, made for socially active, flexible urban centers. The design of the public realm should respond not only to people and not only to nature. Broad, flexible, and varied landscapes preserve the ability of pedestrians to informally drift and seek shade, or as in Boston during the winter, seek sun. And this is critical to the casual lingering of, of users. The sun all but determines the success of an open space, and when urban planners, architects, architects, excuse me, architects and landscape architects ignore its impacts, they do so at their own peril. Thank you so much. I'd like to um, invite Edith and, and Andy Lipkis of Tree People. Um, do you want to join us, Edith? I'm um, going to set, con uh, we're going to do our slides Yes, first. so they each have a series of slides. Um, I'm going to hold them to eight minutes each because they promised. Um, and then we'll talk for a little bit. I need this slides are first. I just wanted to set context for it. So my name is Andy Lipkis, founder, president of Tree People, uh, which has been crowdsourcing solutions to uh, challenges facing our city for um, now 49 years since I started the work as a teenager. And I, um, that's the context, is that we face a lot of challenges in, in Los Angeles. This topic tonight um, about the equity issue runs uh, through the hearts of so many of us. Um, and it's become actually an issue of life and death. So um, Los Angeles is the first city in the United States to have people die of severe heat in winter. Think about that. Uh, that's according to the Centers for Disease Control. It is very much an equity issue, and that's not a matter of intellect. So I know I'm setting a really deep tone here. Uh, we'll lighten up. but. Uh, Trees aren't a matter of simply decoration. They are a, a matter of life and death. If you are Latino in Los Angeles, you are 46% more likely to die on the fifth day of a heat wave here in Los Angeles. If you're African American, you are 48% more likely to die than Anglo people. It's not about your culture. It is about environmental injustice. It is about the cumulative impacts of stressors and inequity. There are m many, some parts of LA, you'll be hearing the specifics in a minute, have 20%, 25% tree canopy. 
South LA, East LA, Northeast San Fernando have un San Fernando Valley have under six percent tree canopy cover, and so how we have done that, as Christopher referred to earlier, is our challenge. But in the context of climate change and resilience and surviving it, it's all in our hands. It is not just a matter of policy. Uh, tree people is one word because when we separate the people from them, the trees don't live and we have a hard time. So we'll pick it up from there and build the case. Thanks. Come on up, Edith. Good evening, everyone. My name is Edith de Guzman. I'm the director of research at Tree People, and I'm going to go ahead and dive right in because Christopher is going to make us pay if we go over eight minutes. So um, we really look at this issue through the lens of public health. Why is that? It's because we started with a very simple question, seemingly simple question. What should LA's tree canopy target be? Seems very simple, not a simple question at all. But when we look at the context, that question becomes more and more complex. Here's the urban context. We know that the majority of Angelinos live in spaces that do not afford them much shade. We have an abundance of heat retaining surfaces and it becomes uh, exacerbated. So when we have heat waves, we have this heat retention that occurs throughout the night and we really don't have an opportunity to really alleviate the impacts. But there's also a really important human context, and here I show you a somewhat fuzzy picture of my mother-in-law. This is Rosie, she's 83 years old. She's a retired LAUSD teacher, and she never learned to drive. Um, she is a Filipino-American who emigrated here from the Philippines and uses public transport. And the reason why I have this picture up here, let me see if there's a laser here. This young man here has taken the only shade that's available. And she is in, in all sort of long sleeves and pants because she has a sensitivity to the sun. So it's very good for preventing skin cancer, but not so good for reducing heat impacts. This translates into really inhospitable situations for us. Um, this is an image on the left. You, you see a thermal image. This is in San Fernando. We had a student, uh, student team from UCLA uh, essentially characterize the pedestrian experience of moving through different spaces in Los Angeles. So here on a 103 degree day, you end up having surface temperatures that are astronomical, 140 degrees on the sidewalk, the, the bus bench itself 125 degrees, but you can see there's a bit of shade there under the shade of this badly pruned, pruned tree that uh, is certainly much, much more hospitable. And you can see, this is our student, but here's actually a smarter rider that's waiting for the bus. So what are we doing about it? Um, as part of the work that I do at Tree People, I've had the pleasure of convening this really um, incredible collaborative of um, national researchers from universities as well as from nonprofit organizations to um, answer a few questions. And we received a, um, a grant from the USDA uh, Forest Service that has enabled us to dive deeply into the issues. Essentially, the questions we are attempting to answer are, how could adding trees and adding reflectivity to, um, to built environment surfaces cool Los Angeles? And would that be enough to actually save lives? We're about two years into this research and we'll be wrapping it up this year. So far, we've done a county-wide assessment looking at how we could reduce heat-related mortality. We also have, um, are in the process of doing sort of a smaller scale analysis on smaller districts in LA. And finally, we're going to do climate projections, which are going to show us whether or not we are, would be able to actually delay climate change. So in effect, we're doing mitigation, not just adaptation of climate change. This is all important because heat is the number one weather-related killer in the United States today. And with the heating climate, of course, it means that we are not going to see uh, much change unless we do something about it. So what did we do? We tested combinations of low, moderate, and high tree canopy, as well as sol solar reflectance of roofs and pavements. So we tried high albedo, uh, low tree canopy cover, vice versa, and so on and so forth. And what we found at the county level is that temperature reductions could exceed one degree centigrade and go up to two degrees centigrade. And this is literally life and death for certain 
sensitive populations, young, the elderly, uh, homeless people, outdoor workers. In terms of mortality reductions, we saw 25% or more, depending on the scenario, which means that we would be saving dozens of lives in the worst heat waves. And finally, we actually found that we could change meteorology. We could actually change some of the air masses that are more oppressive, that kill more people, and shift them to more benign ones. So think about Santa Ana winds that come through. That's a very dry, hot air mass. We could actually, in, in certain cases, actually change that which is pretty phenomenal and unexpected. So how do we get more neighborhoods that look like this one? We need to first know where we're at, and we need to understand where, what the potential is. So toward that end, I'm going to briefly tell you about another project that we've just wrapped up. In fact, on Friday, last Friday, we just had an event for that, uh, sharing the results. Again, funded by the USDA Forest Service, and this time CAL FIRE as well, by uh, the entities on the screen. Here's what we did. We took really high resolution imagery. This is what you would see from, spa uh, from, from either from space or from flying through an air, uh, aircraft. Um, this is imagery that shows infrared, so you're beginning to see just the vegetation. But what was really um, the, the you know, uh, novel piece of what we did here is that we were able to utilize LIDAR, light detection and ranging Im imagery, which essentially means um, that the county was able to contract out flying uh, airplanes over Los Angeles, throwing, you know, uh, sending down um, lasers, and then picking up this very detailed three-dimensional picture of the land below, which allows you to see in the shade of buildings and in, in spaces that you wouldn't just be able to see with the naked eye. So that allowed us to extract what the tree canopy is. And you would think that Los Angeles County would have already had this, but the fact is we didn't. And so this was a really important step for all of us urban forest advocates and, and managers. So we were able to not only have tree canopy extracted, but also a number of other land covers. And here are just a few of the things that this assessment found. Here is a visualization of all of the census block groups in the city of Los Angeles. And what we found is that only five census block groups in the city of LA, which constitute 1% of the population, enjoy 20, nearly 20%, this is 19%, of tree canopy in Los Angeles. Again, 1% of the population, over 10% of the space, enjoys 20%, one-fifth of the city's entire tree canopy. So this is an equity issue, as you can see. In terms of thinking about what should we do, where do we go, where, do we, where is there space, what can we do about it? We looked at existing and possible tree canopy. And we found that on the county level, this is at the county, not the city, recreational uses constitute the highest amount of existing canopy, but they also constitute, uh, recreational and residential also constitute the highest potential for adding more. So we have to think about engaging with those land uses. At the city level, it's a little bit different. Residential land uses are, are number one far by, by far, as you can see, both in existing and in possible. So we really need to think about engaging with residents and with homeowners. Recreational land uses are also very important and rights of way, which we will be hearing about in a little bit from the second panel. I'll leave you with this, which is just a general picture of tree canopy in Los Angeles County by census tract. And what you see is that the lower, uh, are the lighter colors, the yellow, are um, census tracts where the tree canopy is 10% or less. So really in the single digits, and perhaps not surprisingly, these are more urban areas um, where you find more low-income communities of color. And then of course you have the northern part of the county, which is high desert, so ecologically a little bit uh, of a different uh, situation in terms of tree planting. The darker areas see much more tree canopy. Some of them are quite forested with Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, but, you know, this is, uh, this is what we need to look at and understand before we can really uh, move toward a more equitable distribution of tree canopy. Thank you very much. I'm setting my timer for six minutes, so when it goes off, you'll know I have ten more minutes. Uh, <laughs> 
or two. Um, what I wanted to do is set the context for what trees are. We've been pretty much managing them in cities as decorations. And they really are our life support infrastructure. And I say this because the context is our lives in Los Angeles are really threatened by climate change. Not ocean sea level rise, but severe and extreme heat, which is what we've been talking about, but also extreme flooding. About the same amount of rainfall, if not more, in far fewer storms, overtaxing our existing flood control system. That's the projection from the climate scientists. But also, uh, much more drought in between. So lack of water and all of our traditional supplies of water are running out. Um, fire. So there's a way to actually approach LA as an ecosystem, understanding the tree as the tent pole of that ecosystem. Our history has been about engaging communities. Why? Because if we simply go out and be the heroes and plant the trees, they don't live. Not just in LA, but across the country. The average lifespan of an urban tree in America today, a, st a street tree, a city tree, is somewhere between seven years and 15 to 20 years. They die, for the most part, before they get big and can do what we need them to do. When you involve citizens, planting them, caring for them, owning them, and protecting them, very different things happen. So this is the imagery of what our tree planting is happening from tree people and other groups around the city. This is King Boulevard uh, when we crowdsource 3,000 people on 1990 on King's birthday to come out and plant all 52 blocks, seven miles, um, which is great. This is what it looked like the days before. Uh, notice that sign. Uh, that's King from Crenshaw looking west. Uh, this is 2008. Uh, that same sign, you want to see that again? That, this. It's now visible from space. Uh, here is the L.A. City school teacher, um, Eudora Russell, who had the dream and went to Mayor Bradley and said, let's do it. We should honor Dr. King. And he said, great, it'll probably cost um, $10 million and take maybe 10 years to do it. And, and we don't have the money. And she came to me and I said, well, let's do it in a day. And we did. Um, but the reason the trees are alive is because um, Eudora and this guy here on the right came out, this is Jim Hardy on our staff, every year, sorry, every month for 10 years, crowdsourced the community to come out and water the trees and take care of them. Also, everybody who planted them put some of their hair in the hole so they knew that the tree was going to eat their DNA and their DNA would be part of it. Seriously, you laugh. That's part of the key is connection. So what is a tree? Here's a uh, live oak, tent pole of our ecosystem. Here is the biomimicry engineering design that how that tree functions. And why I'm showing it to you is because it's not just the magic green stuff on top. It is the root system and then what it does. So as that tree grew, it made soil. That space of the soil isn't just dirt and rocks and roots. It is habitat for things that dig and drill. Microscopic fungi to big things together they form a tank, a sponge, a wastewater treatment system. The same critters that are in that space are what's taken out of that space, put into the sewage treatment plant to eat our poop and clean water. All water on the planet has gone through a machine like this. Since the planet was born, there's no new water on the planet. The first tenth of an inch of rainfall is caught in the canopy and then slowly released, not just down the trunk, but um, as it uh, it falls out of the leaves. Uh, water that's flowing by fills the space, comes in polluted, the critters clean it, and then the water is sent to the aquifer. If you remove the tree, what happens? Well, it turns out, um, you know, we were trying to help some people defend um, a hundred foot canopy oak from a developer, and it was just an emotional argument. Is it going to come out or not? We keep losing these battles throughout the city, all over the place. And I decided to go for some metrics. I asked the Forest Service what the liquid storage volume was of that space under the oak tree. That tree, with everything in it, five feet deep, 100 feet across, loaded with rock soil, still had the capacity to hold, capture and hold, 120,000 gallons of water in a flash flood, in a 12-inch flash flood. 
take that tree out, what do we lose? The flood protection. 120,000 gallons is a lot. If it was 10 trees, you got over a million gallons flowing down. Someone's going to get hurt. That water has been lost from our aquifer, and it's carrying pollution, soil, everything with it. Biomimicking the tree, this is the cistern at Tree People. Uh, same dimensions, except it's twice as deep. Holds 218,000 gallons of rain water. Um, and not only is it capturing water, but it is evapotranspiring. It is a biological air conditioner. Uh, and um, that's why we're talking about canopy and not just furniture to protect people. So when you, what the tree did was waste management, flood control, water supply, all this stuff, all these different bureaucracies that we've created to replace the tree when we took it out. Unfortunately, we didn't um, replace everything and stop. Thank you. Two minutes. Uh, so if we do what the tree did is integrate and bring everything back together, we can approach the crisis more effectively, save money, find the money. Um, we went to Australia to find solutions for the drought. We found out about how many people were dying there in severe heat. The city of Melbourne created a goal of 40% tree canopy doing tree canopy cover, raising it from what was currently 20%. They lost 200 people in one day in 2009. Um, during the heat. It's been a constant growing problem with climate that they were experiencing earlier. This is what 40% looks like right in the heart of their downtown area, and there weren't trees when they started. This is now a green street, transit way, recreation way. And by the way, those little green things are uh, converted highway uh, road barrier, those plastic tanks, into now street furniture and water tanks to support the trees. Extrapolating that, they built infrastructure with the humans really quickly. 40% of the homes in Melbourne and Sydney and 50% of the homes in uh, Adelaide, who has a climate like ours, installed rain tanks to capture the rain and have that water be available during their drought and then beyond. And we face the same issues and we can do this sort of thing and have water available to support the trees and uh, protect us from severe climate. Capture it, put it back in the ground. I'm not going to get lost in these diagrams, except they're going to take a little while to click through. There's means, ways and means of adapting our city very effectively to give us hope. This is in Sun Valley. These uh, are curb cut swales that biomimic creeks. Water from what was flooding streets flows into them, is captured, recharges the aquifer, prevents the floods makes water available for the trees. Uh, these uh, are six pilots that we built, or five of six pilots that we built around town. Families everywhere love them. They're electronically monitored and uh, censored and remote controlled. So DWP, Department of Water and Power, LA County Flood Control, LA City Sanitation, all contributed to this pilot to test what would happen. Could they? invest in infrastructure in people's homes that would be the new flood control, the new water supply, the new firefighting supply, and water for climate. Uh, it works. Each agency can actually control the water that's in the tank, and uh, I'll go into more detail. What we need to do <laughs> is bring ourselves together like we do in emergency situations and recognize we're in a climate emergency now. We all need data, we need resources, we'll change fast. Um, and we need to take it to the streets, crowdsource the solution. Thank you all. Thanks to both of you. That was very efficient and uh, fascinating. Um, Let's it's actually not a penalty help. Yes, no, you um, stayed clear of the penalty. Um, Andy, let's start with Melbourne. I'm curious how they got to 40% from political, from a policy point of view. How did they execute that goal? How do I turn this on? Is it on? Oh, it's on. Um, they did research like we're doing uh, to, so they haven't achieved the 40% yet. That was one of the first streets. They, they have, um, they, they set a goal to get to 40% based on research. They've committed a lot of dollars. And they've really engaged the community. So one of the things they did to get people 
connected with their trees is they gave every street tree a personality and its own email address. And people write the trees and you know, like, write them love letters, write them saying, oh, there's trash all over you. Oh, God, you look like you're hurting. The city gets all that and is able to respond. And um, that's on a sign, a plaque. How is that marked on the tree? Do you know? Uh, I think. Oh, you just walk up to it with your phone. Oh, it's and, and because geotagged of, her. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah, it, there's no, you know, I'm Sandy, Randy, whatever, on the tree. But right. It, it'll identify itself. And what about American cities? What, are, what cities are um, doing work along these lines that we could and should be looking at? Question for both of you. Do you know anything from, I didn't prepare for that one. Uh, lots of cities are starting to look at this. Um, I don't know that any have set, uh, any others have set goals in, uh, across the states yet. There are, there are many cities which have, um, and I have to say uh, Santa Monica is always a really excellent example. I know in sustainability we all say, yeah, you know, Santa Monica, but it, but it really is if true. If only they, they would build some housing, that's what I always say, <laughs> uh, <that laughs> in terms maybe. of sustainability, but yes, yeah, you're, yeah. it's a good point. Uh, but but they, um, they've been, I think, uh, ahead of the game in terms of really thinking about urban forest management from a very practical and pragmatic perspective rather than just you know the aesthetics. Um, so, uh, in terms of close examples, they've done great, but there are many True City USA, uh, city, Cities USA uh, in the area as well. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, th there are examples for sure. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to actually share with anyone who's interested. We, we've done some research about which cities have targets and what has actually uh, moved them to do that. It's not always a top-down decision. Sometimes nonprofits, you know, play a big role in pushing their municipalities, um, and and um, you know, it's also a very difficult thing to achieve. So it's not, you know, just setting the target doesn't mean that you will, but uh, certainly it moves resources and and focuses attention. Right, which is a nice segue to this tree canopy study, which is, I mean, very well timed for this conversation, but also for I think the the city to begin addressing its own goals. I, I wonder if we could tease out some of what you said, particularly about the capacity. I'm curious about the capacity in, in residential space, for example, and you mentioned that one of the um, necessities now will be engaging with the homeowners. Um, what does that mean exactly? To what extent can that begin to be space that also shades the right of way? Or can you tell us a little bit more about where that conversation might go based on the data that you're now armed with? Sure. So first of all, I'll say that um, the possible uh, piece of the, of the analysis that we conducted, so we showed existing and then we showed possible. Possible means that these are areas that could ostensibly be planted. But, um, you know, certainly if you look at Dodger Stadium, it looks like a great place to plant trees, but, it's, you know, a lot of people would be pretty upset if we, we did tried. That. They wouldn't let us. <laughs> Shade so the so there lot. is going to be some ground truthing that has to be done, but certainly a good percent of the areas that have been identified would allow for planting. Um, now, in terms of engagement, yeah, this is a really, uh, this has been an issue that exists not only in the realm of, of urban forest management, but also um, urban watershed management. How do you cross into areas which are privately owned and for all intents and purposes are pretty difficult for municipalities to actually feel like they have some control over. So I would say that the slides that Andy showed, um, which uh, showed the, um, the cisterns, the, the rainwater harvesting devices, which are remote controlled and can be, um, can, can give the, the semblance of some understanding of what's happening on private property, that, that generally shows kind of a model of what of what could be done and could uh, allow for, uh, for I, I suppose, a partnership between private and, 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 and public. And I think that the, the, what that demonstrated, and actually back in the drought in the 70s, um, we crossed the line where government started realizing that the toilet tank and your shower head was actually affected public costs, and they they used to say we can't invest anything in private property, but by swapping out toilets from seven gallons per flush to one and a half gallons, we massively cut back uh, water use, and we use less water today with a million more people in Los Angeles than we did 30 years ago because of that investment. Uh, partly, the investment was made possible because people really conserved during the drought, and they said, we'll do it. 
where government has tended to believe that requests like that are unacceptable lifestyle change, people won't do it. People have shown they will, and DWP and Metropolitan Water District during the drought invested half a billion dollars in incentives and had caused Angelitos to do something people never thought they would do, which was remove their lawns. So in a partnership with incentives and feedback and guidance, and now we can give really potent strategic guidance right down to GPS points so all of us can be supported in taking restorative, regenerative action, getting feedback, getting incentives to do it, and it could be monitored and managed. And that way we can work fast without having to deal with rights of way and, and stuff like that. But in the right of way, why was the capacity so low in the right of way? Is that because of what we heard in that first excerpt, because of the number of constraints? We, um, the analysis that we did looked at available space. So it would mean, um, you know, unplanted, you know, soil or, or areas that have ground cover. Um, certainly there are a lot of opportunities to actually remove some concrete or asphalt. Uh, we, we didn't add those in, in there. Okay, so that so capacity assumes no change in the current sort of ground cover versus hardscape. Right, right. so yeah. there's plenty of opportunity there as well. But and we wanted to be a bit conservative in that sense. You hit the nail on the head. I mean, we've been a car-dominated city forever. The, the tree division was buried in street services. And, it, uh, and it, we just got, thanks to the mayor, a great leader uh, of street services who's a tree folk person, he's uh, heading street services, and literally, I should have gotten that picture. They immediately changed the logo. So the new, the new logo for street services is little s, big tree, little s, for Department of Streets, uh, making trees come first. The question is, well, in this new reality, in, to get us into the future, will we start shrinking the streets to make room for the trees. Portland, Oregon did that. You know, when, th when their big trees were dying because of incursion and the, the, the trees didn't have enough space, Los Angeles conti continued to widen its streets and wipe out that space. They removed the parking spaces and created much more space for the trees. What's the response from the community? Public squares where where the city didn't have funds, but people contributed. So many public squares with bricks with everyone's name in it. You know, so there's something that says, hey, we have a partnership here. Um, we need your help, uh, and we respect you and your needs, and let's do this together. I think that's a way forward. Mm -hmm. Can we come back to the, the uh, private space of uh, course. for just a moment? So, um, so you had asked, you know, what's the potential of actually, you know, planting on private space and then providing shade or benefit to, to maybe pedestrians or, or, you know, transit riders that are in the area? So um, the qu that question, I think, is highly dependent on sort of what your urban form is. So, you know, there are certain areas where you have, uh, for example, we do a lot of work in Huntington Park in the southeast part of, of uh, the of the county, and they have impossibly narrow streets, uh, very, very narrow sidewalks, and the parkways where you would plant are about, you know, in, in many cases about two feet wide. So the best you could do is plant very small trees. So in that instance, you really want to maximize the amount of tree canopy that you have in, in, in residential areas on, you know, so that you will be providing a benefit to those who are passing through that space. Um, but I wanted to mention a study that came out of USC a couple of years ago that looked at the 20 largest cities in LA County. And they looked over the, s the space of about 10 years how much tree canopy has been lost in single family homes. And it's a pretty tremendous amount of loss. Uh, certain, uh, certain municipalities saw 20% loss in 10 years. And why is that? It's because we have a trend occurring right now of building to the lot line. You see these, you know, older homes that get raised, and and in in their place comes this, you know, McMansion. So, um, so whether or not we allow that to occur, and whether or not we allow trees to be removed, really plays a key role. They also did a companion ana analysis looking at. Um, the municipalities and what kind of tree protections they have, and not surprisingly, those which had stronger protections saw much less loss. A couple more questions. What about the specific kinds of trees that at this moment, given climate change, make the most sense, and in what parts of Los Angeles? I'm sure you have thoughts about that. And we mentioned the palm trees and the concerns about the lack of shade. Of course, there's separate debate on the other end of the spectrum about ficus and um, 
the damage they can do to sidewalks. But what are your thoughts about the kind, specific kinds of trees we ought to be th thinking about planting? In the right of way, particularly, is what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we're doing, I hope we're going to be doing, is figuring out which are the, the most climate ready that states given a list that are not very attractive. Uh, and um, so we start with native uh, indigenous that and the oak. One, one of the reasons why the oak is so important is that it tends not to burn in fires. And all these the intensified fires that we're having, they will uh, toast but not ignite. And we've seen case after case in, in the, uh, the fire in Ventura, the Thomas Fire, where when people had sufficient oaks around their house, they actually stopped the fire the, and caught, trapped the embers. So um, we know we need shade. I don't, I'm hoping we're going to be getting a lot more on which trees are going to be able to do the most, not just shading, but the ev evapotranspiration. The things we have to look for, so evapotranspiration is when they're evaporating, if those of you who are old enough remember evaporative coolers, um, that water as it evaporates creates more cooling. And, but some trees sh uh, shut down and go dormant during um, dry seasons or hot seasons, so you're not getting the evaporation, but you are getting the shade. Uh, do you have any candidates emerging from the work yet? It's not in this scope yet, but. Right, and, and the thing is, when, when you look at trees, you look at so many different benefits, so it really depends on the lens that you're using. So if we look at, um, uh, you know, canopy uh, interception of stormwater or rainwater, you're going to want really not deciduous trees, you're gonna want evergreen trees. So I, I tend to think that the tree that your community wants to see planted that hopefully is not invasive and is pest resistant is probably the right tree because then they'll have a connection to it. Um, there are certainly plant lists and tree lists of you know, do not plant. Um, but there is uh, there's research that's being done, again, by, um, uh, by the US Forest Service and, and UC Davis looking at the climate readiness of certain species. And what they're finding is we're really going to have to start thinking about importing some species from uh, drier climates in the southwest. Uh, Palo Verde is an example, desert willow. Uh, these aren't massive trees, uh, but you know, an issue with that also <coughs> is we need to start stocking them in nurseries more than we currently do. Uh, but that, that's ongoing research that will be informing us over the next couple of years. And the data from this survey, where will you take it next? Where would you like to see city governments, county governments take it? Now that we have this repository, yeah. Well, Jennifer is waving over there because we're already we're you know speaking about this kind of stuff on a weekly basis. Um, this is you know this is data that we have all been really hungry for, and it's just been missing. And I think of it this way, you know, if you have a belly ache and you don't know if did I eat something wrong or is there something really much more you know did I eat something bad or is there something much more you know happening here that. So if we don't know what the issue is, if we don't know what our diagnosis is, we can't really know what we need to be doing. So ideally, what we'll uh, do is be able to engage municipality by municipality and determine here are the greatest opportunities, you know, you know and with, with engaging with residential, you know, that's, that's a challenge, but it's not something that's insurmountable. And we have a really strong tree advocate community here that can help create programs that that um, that can can handle that. So um, I don't know. I mean, there is so much that I, I showed you. Literally, you know, one percent of what came out of this analysis. So we're we're going to have uh, a really fun time talking to the cities. But we're Great. sharing that data with everybody, uh, with governments, so they can plan. And my hope is it will be sharing with you uh, that whether it comes out as a Google Maps layer that you'll be able to get the specific data from the LIDAR because each point is a GPS point. Uh, and then we can start supporting you with modeling and trying on different species and see how they perform at your, at your house in terms of cooling, water protection, capture, and all of that. So that's to come, hopefully really soon. And what, we, what I didn't show in the slides is that we actually have these data by parcel for every parcel in LA County. So sorry about the big brotherness there, but we have data about the existing and potential for right, each. Right, and as Andy mentioned, Tree People has been doing this work longer than anybody. They bring an incredible amount of expertise and uh, wisdom experience. Uh, we're really grateful to both of you for being here. Let's um, thank them for thank their you. comments. Thank you. Hi, uh, 
Um, I'm Michelle St. Louis, a senior in Oxy, um, and this excerpt is from Inherent Vice by Thomas Pynchon. Um, Crocker Fenway's club was housed in a Moorish revival mansion dating from the Doheny McAdoo era. In a room off the lobby where they sent Doc to cool his heels was a mural depicting the arrival of the Patola expedition in 1769 at a bend of the river near what became downtown LA. Pretty close to here, in fact. The pictorial style reminded Doc of labels on fruit and vegetable crates when he was a kid. Lots of color, atmosphere, attention to detail. The view was northward toward the mountains, which nowadays people at the beach manage to see only once or twice a year from the freeway when the smog blew away, but which here, through the air of those early days, were still intensely visible, snow-topped, and crystal-edged. A long string of pack mules wound into the green distance along the banks of the river, which was shaded by cottonwoods, willows, and alders. Everybody in the scene looks like a movie star. Some are on horseback, packing muskets and lances, and wearing leather armor. On the face of one of them, maybe Portola himself, there was an expression of wonder, like, what's this, what unsuspected paradise? Did God with his finger trace out and bless this perfect little valley, intending it only for us? I'm Eleanor Hall, a senior at Oxy. This is from an essay called Growing Shade by the landscape architect and planner Joyce Early Linden. It was first published in Places Journal in 1984 and included this illustration by Joyce and her husband, the architect Maynard Linden. In a broad band of country north of the Alps, the sun shelter which makes an outdoor room for a street cafe or a garden restaurant is likely to be an assembly of tree umbrellas, a double row of living and growing trees, horse chestnuts or London plains, trained into a flat-topped structure with a 10-foot ceiling and a leafy roof. Many of these outdoor rooms are more than 100 years old, once used by strangers traveling on horseback over hot, dusty roads, as well as by the village inhabitants escaping from the summer sun. The tree trunks are, thirsty to, are 30 to 40 inches in diameter, and some of the cantilevering branches are as thick as the roof beams in the local barns. Their robust scale is in keeping with the adjacent buildings and spaces. The horse chestnuts make dark, solid shade. The leaf cover of the plains is more translucent, more open, making changing dappled patterns. As for training the trees, a German forester agreed that there was not much on the subject in books, and it would be under parks, not forestry. At the offices of a Swiss city parks department, the recommended expert explained, London Plains, Platinus acerfolia, are easier to manage than horse chestnuts, Aesculus hippocastanum, which persists in trying to grow high in the center. Plains will tolerate dirty air better than chestnuts. Dry soil is suitable for both. Buy the sapling, specifically grown for the purpose from a tree nursery. It will have an upright stem and three or four whippy branches. Plant and at once cut off the stem just above its junction with the top branch, plain, or top pear, chestnut. Train the branches by binding them to horizontal supports. As the tree grows, select and encourage subsidiary branches to become webs in the roof structure. Cut off unwanted growth in the summer, summer, not autumn, cleanly back to its base. Leave no stubs. New shoots will sprout each season and produce the leaves. The shoots must be cut off biannually back to their base to maintain the required profile. Good luck. As he was leaving, the expert turned and called out, Es ist nicht Kunst, es ist flessige Fliege. It's not art, it's diligent attention. Um, it's not art, it's diligent attention could be our... Um, our theme for the evening. And can we have a round of applause for all four of the student speakers? Um, they're, they're very brave to do it. And I always like to incorporate um, student participation where, where possible. So thank you to all four of you. I think that really added something. Um, now we'll move to our second conversation. And we will begin with Sara Suleiman. 
um, who many of you will know from her coverage uh, in Streets blog. She is a writer, journalist, photographer, and advocate for all of the issues that we're talking about. Um, so we'll hear some uh, from her and see some images. She will be followed by Gerdo Aquino, landscape architect who's the CEO of SWA uh, Landscape Office. He will show some images. Um, and then the two of them, my colleague uh, Jennifer McDowell from the mayor's office, we will sit down for a, a conversation to close out the evening. Sarah. So exciting. Um, sorry. Uh, so, hi, I'm Sara, and I'm a reporter, and I'm going to tell you things, and I'm going to go fast. Um, <laughs> because I have a lot to get through, and i got to get to Nipsey. Like, that's the end, and so we, we got to get there. So I don't have a timer, so just, like, okay. make signs. Yeah. Make signs. So um, one of the things that uh, I've, I've been covering South Central for seven years, and I got on my bike and decided to see how people were faring with 100-degree heat. And... This is about how well they were doing while they were waiting for the bus. Um, you see a lot of this kind of thing. A lot of times you'll see folks like lined up all the way back in that one shadow because that's all there is. Or you'll see like the Rus Russian nesting doll approach with like the mom and then like subsequent children trying to make space. And I think part of the, the attraction of thinking about it through the lens of bus stops is that it's easy like, oh, well, we can fix it. Like, we need to uh, change the relationship between, uh, er, enhance the way we take transit and, and enhance the transit experience. But the thing is that South Central and Boyle Heights, which you saw in their map of the tree canopy, are really missing a lot of um, shade. And so people tend to bring it with them, um, especially because it's multi-generational communities and their elders, their wheelchairs, and they are transit dependent, and they get most places via two feet. And so you have to really be thinking about, um, and this is what I want really want to focus on, is this question of who are we making shade for, and how do you make sure that everybody um, feels like what you're providing is for them? Because a lot of what's happening right now, with, and I'm sure that you hear in the conversation about gentrification, is this sort of question of who gets to control the public space. And a lot of these communities, like South Central, were left behind. They were disinvested in, they were neglected, and they were repressed. And so they've never had the power, they've never had dominion over the public space. They've never had that ownership. And now new folks are coming in and saying, oh, well, let's, like, let's take another look at this public space. Meanwhile, folks have been chased out of the public space, especially by a repressive policing. And so they've never really had access to it in the first place. And so when you're thinking about how do we make sure that our, like as we change the, the landscape and we try to address some of these needs, that we're actually making sure that we're inviting everybody to, to have a part in it. And are we really engaging the way that those folks use that space? I'll go faster. So, because um, a lot of times what happens in South Central, for example, that's the space shuttle, when it came through in 2012, um, they didn't notify the public that they were cutting down, they, they pasted notices on the trees, 400 of them were going to come out, but they didn't like hold a meeting, tell anybody, so I had to write articles about it and, 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 and let folks know. But So they're usually the ones that, that have the la least amount of control over their communities. Or like if you're familiar with Hoover Boulevard or Hoover Avenue on, um, in South Central near USC, this was recently supposedly improved. They ripped out the most beautiful jacaranda trees and replaced it with this monstrosity. Um, and it's supposedly an improvement because now there's actual seating, but there will never be shade. So you do with that what you will. Um, and so folks in Boyle Heights knew that this is how they were going to be treated. And so when the East Side Access Project, which was a $12 million project to enhance the transit um, experience along the gold line and to facilitate uh, active transportation so you could bike to the train, whatever it might be, um, 90 trees started coming out of the sidewalks like, and nobody was notified. And so suddenly one day trees were starting to come down. So this says, por favor, no, no dejen que me corten. Don't let them cut me down. Um, I had a friend, uh, or see, what was happening was then you were having those massive trees replaced with these twigs 
and fake flowers, which were bike racks, which nobody used because they didn't know what they were, and which sort of <laughs> point to just how, how barren the street was after you took out all the trees. So it was, kind of, it was terrible. And then you have these menacing butterflies, which are also bike racks. And this is in front of my friend's gallery. And he's an artist, and so he held a poetry night where they, uh, the community came together, they read poems to the trees, and they talked about, like, this was uh, yet one more in, in justice, one more way in which the community had been treated badly and had had uh, resources taken from them in the guise of improvement. Um, and so, like, even the placement of the street furniture was terrible. You can see, like, all the trees are gone. The bench is now in front of the bar that opens at 6 a.m. instead of in front of the high school where they really need it. Like, it just was, like, they just, the problem is, and the reason where I'm going with this, is that oftentimes when planners think about cities, they look at a space and they say, oh, there's nothing there. And the reason they think that is, again, because these communities have not had access to power. And so like Lamert Park, which is here on the right, that, was a, that plaza was a year and a half in the making. And the, the city still screwed it up, but I'll get to that in a second. So the question is, like, when you're thinking about planning spaces, when you're thinking about who um, you're planning for, are you thinking about everyone? Are you thinking about these kids that use parking lots as football uh, courts because they're not allowed to play in parks? <laughs> because um, it's prohibited there because it tears up the grass. And their shoes melt in the summer. Like they get about halfway through bef the summer before the bottoms of their shoes melt. Are you thinking about my friends Cholo and Fino, who are former gang members who can't go to a park alone because of the gang issues in Watts, but who um, can go in larger groups when you have adults who can navigate those complicated dynamics. And there's not enough shade for them, and so they're like taking shade in the side of a building after a kickball game, which was also part of this. Not a lot of shade. It's a great park, but not a lot of shade. Um, and also, all around South Central, you have a lot of memorials to folks who have died. Um, you have folks that have been hit in drive-bys. You've got folks that have been killed by cars a lot of mourning. And because families have been there for generations, um, they need a place to remember what they've lost. And so, you know, there's no, there's nothing along this street. And so it's just one more, one more way in which the streets are used. Sorry, that's my Marco Rubio moment. Um, so uh, one of the ways that folks use, let me go back. Um, when folks talk about reclaiming streets for people, in communities of color, we're often talking about what it means to reclaim that for ourselves, for our identities, for folks to be able to be black in public, to express that identity in all of its, its facets. And in Lamert Park in particular, right now they're, they're rebranding themselves um, as a, home, a hub for black creatives that are grounded in the diaspora. And so, so much of their streets involve festivals and expressions of culture in the community. And this plaza, which I mentioned was a People Street plaza, there's a city template for People Street um, that allows communities to get together to put together a plaza. We worked for a year and a half, like, because these blasted polka dots are so generic and have, they're so ahistorical, acultural, they are nothing, they, they make me ill to my stomach. I am not bitter in any way whatsoever. And so the, um, the community came together and they, does, they use these adinkra symbols, which are Ghanaian and which um, communicate meaning, uh, values of the community, and they painted them in the polka dots. But the problem was they, they negotiated with the city for a long time about shade, but because the city thinks of public space as spaces where you need to have it adaptable, like it needs to have a lot of different potential uses, these people had a very clear idea of what they wanted in their public space, how they were going to use it as a, as a place for festivals, as a place for cultural celebrations. Do, am I, like, I got to wrap up? Okay. So, um, like, every week there's always something happening in that plaza, and yet, like, the most that they could get from the city is like a little umbrella. So they want to see their culture themselves reflected in their infrastructure. And instead, at the Crenshaw line, what Metro is doing is putting in place things that are more representative and reflective of the architecture as opposed to the stories of the people, which is where our destination Crenshaw came in. 
Um, how much time do I have? Am I way over? I'm a couple of minutes over. All right. Nipsey was part of that. It's part of storytelling through, um, through histories. And the shade structure, since we are talking about shade, um, one of the shade structures that they were putting in place mimicked a Bermuda grass, which was something that was brought over as bedding hay on the transatlantic strafe trade. And like the people that came on this, that, uh, that ride that they did not want to be on, they were not expected to survive and thrive, and yet they did. And so the shade structures that they're putting in, like you can see it up there, it's not particularly beautiful, but it actually mimics the grass that came over with those folks hundreds of, hundreds of years ago. And so I had never seen in planning that level of intentionality in thinking about how each element of street furniture really will speak to the community's history and the community's story and tell it through that space. So you can do that in a way like they didn't do in Boyle Heights and they put in those hideous butterflies. So there are, there are ways to do it. There are ways to do it. And now I've really gone over. So um, anyways, I'll just end there. We can come back to that if we need to. All right, what do I have? Three minutes? Okay. I'm so All right. Sorry. That's good. That's good. I heard you, though. Let, let's do this. Okay, so my name is Gerardo Aquino, and uh, I'm a landscape architect, designer, urbanist, writer, academic, and big advocate uh, for the public realm. I love this image because it, it kind of speaks to the, the sense of big nature we have in LA, right? We have the Pacific Ocean, we have our kind of foothills and mountains, and then there's this kind of nuance in between, and I think it's that kind of in between that really drives everybody in this room to kind of think about and think deeply about what's next in our city and, and how uh, that in between could become more legible. So um, I'm actually building on what's already been said, right? 24.9%. That is, um, sorry, 24.9%. So that is the tree and shrub cover in LA City. And the thing is, majority of that is up in Griffith Park where it's kind of hard to get to. And then of that 24.9%, 11% is the tree cover, which means that we have a lot of these spaces that are all about opportunity these are contiguous systems, they're right of, right of ways, and I think that in the context of at least this forum it is certainly uh, ripe for more investigation. So what I'm gonna talk about is how these kind of metrics uh, really add to what we do as landscape architects, that it's not so much about beauty anymore. I still have uh, senior principals at our firm who speak about beauty first, and the narrative second, metrics second. Now it seems more that we need to think about the metrics and the narrative first uh, before the design can really come to fruition. And so I'm gonna talk about one narrative, one, one project. This is uh, from the US Forest Service. It shows again kind of uh, the areas in green and red where red is uh, a kind of um, an area that is in the most need of open space and green cover. Green, obviously, with Griffith Park. It's a kind of environmental equity diagram. And so the project that I'm gonna talk about is the Ricardo Lara Linear Park in the city of Linwood. And that kind of stretch of red there is really downtown all the way to kind of south of Compton. And Linwood is right in the heart of that. Ricardo Lara is a, was a state senator here. He's kind of moved on to other higher positions in California, but he grew up in Linwood and he became the champion for this park. And the thing about landscape architecture is you need uh, these champions, right? You need people who fight for social injustice and equity at all levels. And he wanted to find a park that was central. He knew of a right of way in their town which is connected by this uh, right of way that was historically a rail line, the red car. And, and there it was in plain view. It was 45 feet wide, one mile long, right in the heart of the city, next to the freeway, and connecting to the LA River. 
uh, it was all about trying to figure out how do you connect this potential open space to the rest of the city and how could it be the open space that this community really deserved. And along the way, it was all about trying to add more metrics. Every time we presented a design, it was, well, we need more metrics, we need more backup. And so the EnviroScreen, it was absolutely solid red, right, in terms of the pollution index. We were asked to develop a logic for what is the tree density, uh, what is appropriate, how do you establish the logic. So we worked with uh, some different folks and the overall tree density in LA is about 20 acres, 20 trees per acre. Um, the benchmarks, again, these are from the US Forest Service, ranged anywhere from nine to 120 trees per acre in other US cities. For example, Atlanta is 111 trees per acre. And so the city of Linwood wanted to set our benchmark at 80 trees per acre, about 400 trees as a way to begin the discussion so it's less arbitrary. We built up uh, metrics on carbon sequestration, which we all know. And the result was a, is a mile long linear park that allowed the community to see the fruits of their labor in terms of all the community outreach and a lot of the environmental goals that they set for it. This is what it was, uh, and it was like this for, I think, a period of 30 years. And it was a, an abandoned space. It was a used car parking lot. It was a farmer's market. And it had some interesting functions. But the community wanted more. And so the notion of kind of walking under trees, adding shade through canopy structures, trees, creating places for kids to play in nature, places of exercise, all became kind of the, the agenda for this park. It was also a park that had to find money. You know, oftentimes these parks have no money. They're different than other parks with, with wealthy uh, donors. Uh, these cities are fighting for it. So part of the money is coming from, uh, from water grants, air quality grants, and proving that we can take water from the freeway, run it through the park, and uh, filter 82,000 square feet uh, acre feet of water in any given rainfall. And so the transformation of these kinds of landscapes that were there before have now been transformed into these kind of ecologically vibrant placemaking opportunities that, again, the community had been asking for for years and now are starting to see uh, some reality to it. The project was all about density and ethnicity too. Uh, Ricardo Lara was, was really a part of the community. He was born there, he was raised there, and so he was sensitive to the needs of the community in terms of arts and culture and history. And so part of the programming was to make sure that the mile-long park had the capacity to take on different community arts, um, places for arts and kids, in this case, a dance floor, I, I'm guessing, and also uh, STEAM learning. Uh, STEAM learning is, is very relevant right now. It started with nature deficit disorder in a lot of cities, but now it's starting to transform into STEAM learning, uh, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And the landscape then becomes kind of this outdoor classroom uh, that can then build on itself. And finally, I just want to say that recently the ULI Urban Land Institute uh, recognized this project with their first ever Global Social Impact Award. And, and I think that speaks uh, highly of where the professions of landscape architecture, playing and urban design are starting to uh, go and what they're starting to pay attention to. So thank you. How about dancing kids? <laughs> Let me bring the panelists up. Um, and let me introduce Jennifer Pope McDowell, my colleague in the mayor's office who we haven't heard from yet, who I should mention is an Oxy alumna, yes. right? Class of 2008, yes. is that right? Yes, okay. go triumphy. Yes. <laughs> so first of all, tell us your title in the mayor's office and then we can, I wanna talk about sort of how this plays out within the right of way from the point of view of city policy a little bit before we go back to our other speakers. Excellent. Um, so Jennifer McDowell, I'm our Associate Director of Infrastructure with the Mayor's Office of City Services. Um, I've had the pleasure of serving with the mayor for about four years on infrastructure policy related to the public, uh, to public works and specifically in the right of way. 
So we heard in the one of the first excerpts, I think, the essay by Sam Va Valentine. Um, he no Sam Block oh, that 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 essay on shade when he asked who who decides where the shade goes, which I think is. Um, a really fitting question. So if you could, and you're always the person I go to in the mayor's office when I have a question about the particular policy of the right of way, who controls what in the city. Um, so I wanna borrow that expertise a little bit. If you kind of, if we can help the audience imagine a cross section of a typical city street from the curb, um, storm drain, the sidewalk, tree well, all the way to the property line. Can you just give us a sense of who is involved? It's a very, very much a gray area in terms of jurisdiction. Gerdo's nodding. Um, who controls what, and sort of how does that policy play out in terms of you know as we think about shade in that kind of an area? That's great. Yeah, it, it's a complex area for sure. Uh, very small, but very dense in terms of the number of jurisdictions that control um, the decisions that are being made there. Um, I would say it's it's a handful of agencies, even within the city, but then when you break that up into the different divisions and groups within those different departments or bureaus, it, it can easily become a, you know, a dozen or more um, agencies that really kind of function within their own silos. So, um, and then you have the, the building, um, the design, and then the maintaining of that infrastructure. So our, our Bureau of Street Services, who I know is in, in the house tonight, um, <laughs> we've got our, our assistant director, Greg Spots, back there. Uh, good to see you, Greg. Um, they are um, uh, the builders and the keepers of the right-of-way. So they're the ones that uh, put down the asphalt, um, build the sidewalks, the curbs, the gutter, um, dig the, the tree wells. Um, and But we have a number of guidelines that, that decide what they build and where. We have you know, planning, which will decide you know, what classification of street goes where in transportation, which um, ensures that you have a proper type of street um, in, in the area and that the infrastructure will match that, either the width of the street, um, the type of transportation that goes on there, whether there's trucks or residential cars. Um, and then, uh, and transportation then also determines the, the striping on the street and the use of the street. So while street services make sure that it's, it's in good condition, then you have another department come on top of that and say, uh, do we want bike lanes here? Do we want protected, you know, parking on the street or just during certain parts of the day? Um, and then on top of that, as you mentioned, we kind of have the, the substructure, the sanitation, uh, ma managing our stormwater uh, conveyance systems and capture um, all of the different utilities, uh, street lighting, DWP, your uh, internet providers, um, uh, and anyone that you can imagine digging uh, trenches and running utilities under the street as well. Um, who have I missed? I mentioned street lighting. Um, I mentioned street services for building, but then also making decisions when it comes to planting trees, uh, installing street furniture. Um, and then on top of that, you've got county agencies um, that have, you know, there's other cities' transportation systems, metro transportation system. Um, it's, it's very dense, and each of those systems has their own set of rules that helps to them decide what goes where. Um, however, there isn't a larger kind of meta set of rules that helps helps those agencies play well with each other. So there's something that says you can't put a street tree within so many feet, as, as someone mentioned, of, of a driveway or a street light um, or, or a, a bus sign. But there's no one that's actually saying, well, if we put a bus sign here, that means that I can't then put a street tree here, you know, but, but the, bus, the bus sign person is kind of thinking within their realm of, of calculating to make a certain decision. So there's, it's, it's, a, it's a, a network that's... I, I have a suggestion uh -huh. for you guys. Yeah, please. <laughs> Are you kidding? That's why we're here, please. I, because I work with all of those agencies you just talked about. You guys need to have a retreat, you know? <laughs> you just need to get out of the city or something and just, just talk to each other. Yeah. I mean, for, for example, there's this one document that, that we have at, that is from one of these agencies, and it's called Shy Distance. You ever hear of this? No. You've never seen this? Has anybody seen this little section diagram called Shy Distance? Published Anyone? Block? Anyone from the city? Anybody? No. Shy, S-H-Y, distance. S-H-Y, okay. Shy Distance. And it's awesome. And it shows a little section hand-drawn of the distance 
that a person should be from the face of curve based on speed of a car. And the faster the car, the more objects that they put in between the curb and where a pedestrian is supposed to walk. And it dictates the width of the walk, too. And it's a very interesting thing. And, and whenever I bring it up, nobody seems to know about it. And, but yet, it's still somehow relevant, uh, even today. And so, yeah, retreat. You guys should do that. No, I will say that really the charge of my office is to think about the design of these spaces in a comprehensive way, which we haven't really done. So I would say stay tuned. There's a lot of interesting work that we want to do to begin to bring that question. Maybe the retreat is where we start um, thinking about that work. But as you look into the future a little bit, which parts of that relationship are shifting? Can you give us an update on street furniture, where that's going, stormwater, new regulations, all kinds of things, perhaps the kinds of trees that we're picking or tree well size? Just give us a sense of sort of where that um, right of way is changing and in ways that people will begin to see. Excellent. So um, speaking of retreat, actually, um, and uh, Andy, I think you mentioned our, our new director of street services. Um, our uh, Bureau of Street Services is hosting a, a tree summit um, next Friday um, to actually to look at the various um, um, tree issue, tree related issues that we have in the city. And I would say we're in a very unique time and place right now um, because we have the political will. Everyone is paying attention. Um, the mayor is paying attention. The city council is paying attention. Um, the, everyone knows what, what the peril is. And we also now have the data. So the data that you saw that, that Tree People released is an incredible data set. We have known kind of anecdotally and from past less, less nuanced data sets where the low canopy areas are in a sense, but what we haven't known is what we need to move the needle in those areas. Is it right of way tree planting? Is it residential tree planting? Is it you know optimizing the trees in our open spaces? And the data that they have and and uh, um, Edith kind of very eerily mentioned we have it down to the they have it down to the parcel level, um, so we you know we might be knocking on your door. Um, will allow us to to tailor what the needs are in in our low canopy areas, um, and we have a, a very unique um, opportunity with the right of way uh, just because of its visibility and its high impact, and I think that's why. Um, you know, having the types of discussions that, that street services is having right now is that, that much more important. Um, looking at how do we revise our standard plans to, um, to increase the size of our tree wells and help our city engineers make thoughtful decisions when it comes to um, the plans that will just kind of be by default um, issued to developers or city crews, making sure that we, we try to optimize the amount of space for, for street trees. So there is, there is a, a standard plan kind of revitalization effort or renewal effort going on. Um, you mentioned street furniture. Also an incredible turning point in, um, in the conversation for street furniture. So uh, one, the contract that we currently have that, that um, was mentioned, I think it was in, in the article that you referenced, is under review. Um, and the performance has been incredibly poor. It's been about 50% of the street furniture, the bus shelters that we had initially expected to be put out onto the streets, only 50% of those have been put out. Um, and it's been a, a combination of, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit of everyone's fault. And um, we've learned lessons within the city of what needs to happen to make sure that this next this next round of street furniture that we can put them, one, put them in the ground, and then two, put them in the locations where they're really needed. Because yes, it has been, it has been largely influenced by advertising, by our the the um, the contractor that and the the group JC Deco, um, who's been deciding where these go. And you know, in the city, we've had some say. Um, however, we're now looking at exactly what was mentioned in that article. We're looking at high transit routes. We're looking at where the people are, who has these shelters and who doesn't. How can we have more equitable distribution? Um, and then also, um, what, what does it take to, to, um, to kind of change our right of way infrastructure to meet the demands that we have for shade, be it in trees, be it in street furniture? Um, something's going to have to give. Um, in many areas, uh, whether it's on the street or in, um, in residential properties. 
I think it's looking at the data like what Tree People has to, to really dial into those areas. And you know, it's not gonna be a one solution fits all, but to figure out what, what will help this one community? What, what is the solution here that we need to focus on so that we can increase shade? And we also have, we will be hiring an urban forester also. Thank and that you. job description is still open, right? Yes. For our applications, we maybe you can talk a little bit about that. We have a city that. forest officer. It's the first in the city. Um, as I've mentioned street services a lot and they're fantastic and, and they're here. Um, but there's also other uh, departments in the city that manage trees. Um, our recreation and parks, uh, Department of Recreation and Parks, um, our uh, Department of Water and Power, um, city planning makes decisions on trees. So we are um, hiring one person, one human, uh, who will oversee all of the policy and programs related to trees to make sure that we are executing, that we have a singular vision and that we're executing it and everything that we And do. that will be located where? That position will be located where? It'll be located in the Board of Public Works. Um, it was, we had to walk a fine line of making sure it was embedded in a city department so that it could kind of carry forth beyond any political administration. However, that it was high enough and still accessible enough to elected officials that it would have influence beyond one department. Can I say add something about the bus stops? Please. Um, because it's such a, I mean, it, like the, the, it's a 20 year contract and I think that that's what is so crazy to me about it, that that was something that was negotiated 20 years ago when the conversations around public space were so different. Um, but also, you know, in the conversations that I've had with Francois Nion, um, who is the head of, of JC Deco, and about the auditing process or the um, permitting process as well, which I think, and I can't remember now because it's been a couple of years since I've written on it, but it was like 159 days it averaged for a permit to go through the city hall only to be stopped. Like it was just, it was such a ridiculous amount of time to get these things approved. And at some point, because the 20 year contract, the expectation is because he's putting them in for free essentially. Like your LA is not paying him. He is putting this stuff in um, and it, that's why you have to have the, the panels on it because that's where the revenue is generated. Um, and so what he was, the case that he was making to me at one point was um, that, that after a certain amount of time, if you have a 20 year contract and now the last two years, LA is like, oh, well, like, let's start putting this stuff in. To him, that return isn't there. That's not, the, that's not what he signed up for either. And so it's like, I don't, I have to track the, one of my things on my to-do list as a reporter is to track this better now. But um, I know that those negotiations are beginning, but that was that audit um, was pretty damning with regard to how well the city was managing that program. So um, I wanted to follow up on the Destination Crenshaw with you, Sara, also because okay. um, yeah, it's a nice bookend to the first. No, no, no. It's a, it's a really nice bookend of the first conversation we had on March 6th where Councilmember Harris Dawson came and presented that project in the, in the context of a larger conversation about relationship to place and the tricky question of how you reflect a kind of the community's interest in the design that's being produced. And I want to dig into this question a little bit with both of you, particularly that one you've covered that project um, extensively. Can you talk a little bit about the particular kind of engagement strategy that gave rise to just the particular shade structure that you said really reflects kind of expectation? Because those of you who are not familiar with Destin Destination Crenshaw, it's conceived as a kind of outdoor museum which will run along the route of the Crenshaw Line light rail route. Um, in Among other things, its goal is to be a sort of bulwark against um, against displacement, gentrification, and uh, a protector of community heritage yeah. and memory. So I'm curious how it played out in terms of the conversations with the community that gave rise to that design. And Gerda, I'd be curious about other examples where that's been successful in producing a particular kind of shade that is reflective of um, the design, uh, community's design interest. Yeah, so D Destination Crenshaw is a 1.3 open air, well, 1.3 mile open air. Uh, museum essentially, and it's a, a, what Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson calls a, a turning insult into opportunity. That the train line um, is now being run through the heart of the last black corridor in the city, and it's being run at grade. And with the history of the way the infrastructure has been used with regard to dividing communities and, and decimating black communities and displacing, and so the community took a look at this and said, How? Um, like we had to fight to even to get a stop at Lamert Park, like 
the black community was not given the same level of recognition that you, another cultural community might have been. Like they had to fight the city for a long time to get recognition as a community. And so all of that taken together, they started having these conversations about how can we let, if you're gonna run it through our community, you're gonna know where you are. <laughs> You're going to know where you are. And in fact, when it comes up at Slauson, there's going to be a 120-foot tower that says Crenshaw. Um, and so it's, it's going to be very clear you're in an unapologetically black space. And then the question is, well, what does that mean? Because blackness is ever-evolving. It's ever-changing. It's changed over time. How do you, is there one black story? Are there two? Are there five? Like, who gets to tell that story? That in and of itself is a negotiation, given that because of segregation, because of redlining, you have within a black community in particular, you have a lot of, um, you have a great range of economic uh, situations. You have folks that are, are the most destitute and you have some of the wealthiest black folks in the country. So whose story are you telling? And so that sort of became the question of like, what ties us all together? What about our experience ties us together as, as opposed to how we see ourselves in relation to the rest of the community? And so they started going back to this question of where we came from. <coughs> And how do we bring that into the public space? How do, we, how do we tell our story and how we evolved in the different ways that we evolved through that infrastructure? And so that question of root shock, you know, being up, taken out of Africa, all of your connections being severed and having to put down roots and grow where you're planted, which is another one of their themes, grow where you're planted, um, and thrive somewhere else. And the reason that they really like that grass um, in particular is because it's a rhizome, and for the plant people here, you may correct me, I might be wrong, um, but it, it functions via nodes. And so um, it, it builds like a strong root node, and then it shoots out new root systems, but also shoots up to the surface. And that's how the community was seeing itself sort of mimicked in the structure of the way that that grass operates, which also came over with them and managed to survive and thrive, although it shouldn't have. And so there, it went really, really deep. Like I've never seen that level of intentionality in the way that um, the, the commitment to telling story through all different facets of it. And that's why I had the, the photo with Nipsey up there and Biddy Mason, like these different nodes are different elements of the story um, all along the way. So it's, it's being told through that shade infrastructure and can you talk well. a little bit about Nipsey Hussle's involvement? Because he was a donor to the project, but also really involved with the council office and, and developing it. Yeah, he was. Um, he actually gave it the name Destination Crenshaw. He has uh, grew up on that corner of Slauson and Crenshaw. He lived there pretty much in that parking lot since the age of 14, where he'd been hustling his music there forever. Um, and what, to me, was so special about his participation and um, mattered so much was that Gang members are considered to be the source of blight as opposed to a product of it. And so they're often the first people that you push out when you are doing, quote unquote, an improvement to a public space. And so for Marquise Harris Dawson, who had been an, a community organizer at Community Coalition in the community for 20 years, to say, who, and who had worked with youth, that's what the, that organization did before he became, he became a council member, to have the the ability to say, no, we need to bring in those who are on the, the farthest on the margins um, and bring them into the conversation about how they understand public space as well. And so Nipsey is someone who is also trying to uplift the community from his, from his corner of the world there at, at Slauson. Um, his, his story of improvisation is the story of so many youth in that community, of, of kids that had no, that grew up in, in in the era of the war on drugs, who saw their, their friends being put away for years, whose fathers were swept up in sweeps. Like there were the 80s and 90s, you had sweeps of like hundreds and thousands of men would be arrested on a weekend. Just arrested just for being in that neighborhood. That's the era that he grew up in. And so you, how can you leave those folks, those are the most marginalized folks aside. And so, um, so he was part of speaking to those youth and saying there's a place for you in this project that, that we we want your story. Your story has value. Mm. And Gerda, we don't... Well, sorry, I'm so long-winded. No, we don't, we don't so often think of... I just want to say something yeah, please. Really, really quick. Please. I, first of all, I'm really inspired by what the city is doing. I think the trajectory of what you guys are talking about is absolutely positive. Although, you know, as a landscape architect or architect, uh, we often are, are at that place in the process where we're sort of given a set of rules. And those rules 
do not include very specific metrics on creating shade. Oftentimes it's us kind of doing these qualitative assessments of what we think is appropriate and we're getting there with the, the tree people and all the metrics that are being developed but I would say when you go to your retreat you take out <laughs> take out the whiteboard and and start developing some policy almost formulaic like maybe there's a percentage of tree cover based on certain species for biodiversity and shade maybe there's a certain percentage of kind of architectural shade for different kinds of programming that might happen underneath it and and that will start to get us all on the same page. Otherwise, we're still doing qualitative assessments of what we think is right. And I think LA deserves a kind of very progressive way of moving that forward. I'll, I'll just mention something to that. I, I love the idea. Um, and we are definitely going in that direction. I'm going to put you on my call list. <laughs> um, but um, uh, another thing to look out for is uh, Mayor Garcetti is releasing his second sustainable city plan um, in about a week and a half. Um, and it will include some quantitative metrics on tree canopy cover um, that are very aggressive. And so we are hoping, we are absolutely planning on, on getting past sort of that, that kind of qualitative metric and into quantitative. What does it mean to really move the needle on our canopy cover and increasing shade? I think what we're seeing is the long recovery from the city of having dedicated itself so aggressively to cars and to a kind of notion of private amenity, right? And even in, in the planning world, the, the shift from um, level of service to VMT, vehicle miles traveled, which many of you will be familiar with, has been a really important change in policy that has helped us um, really think, think about infill development and building housing, for example, and its relationship to tra uh, transit lines in a much different way. I think we're beginning to see some different metrics emerge in terms of how we're planting, planning the right of way, but it's a very slow recovery from, as, as this group all knows, many, many decades of having invested in um, making more space for cars and allowing uh, solo drivers, you know, to, to make their way across the city as efficiently as possible. And if there has been a, a kind of um, central theme in all of these conversations, uh, in these third LA conversations, it's the, it's the uh, amount of investment, aggressive investment in that kind of second LA paradigm, right, that we made for so many decades that will take um, a similar amount of time to, um, to make up for, to change the trajectory on. But I think after our retreat, maybe we'll come back here in a year, uh, but it seems to me that w if we were to reconvene in a couple of years in a similar conversation, we might be, be talking about much different level of progress. Um, so we're out of time. Please join me in thanking all of our panelists for being here.